No, actually, it's it's a, it's a very, very, very good thing. Glad to be home. Get, glad to be with you all and in fellowship once again. I have the privilege of introducing our missionaries this morning. Stan and Bessie Cruz, would you come forward? Stan and, and Bessie have been ministering in the Philippines for the last couple of years. But before that, they were our missionaries in China. And um, we all like to move where God wants us to go. And so Stan and Bessie heard the call of God to go to the Philippines and minister there. And uh, there's been some exciting things going on there. And I really want to give an opportunity to Bessie to tell us about what the Lord has been doing for her and with her. You know, um, we just had an opportunity to express stewardship to the Lord. And really that's something that the Lord has been working with um, Bessie in the Philippines. So Bessie, tell us a little bit about what God has been doing with you. Um, <clears throat> actually, we were missionaries in the Philippines since before we were sent to China. So uh, I met Stan as a single missionary in the Philippines, but I was already a member of the um, Christian Reformed Church in Los Banos in the Philippines. So it was planted by a missionary. So I would say I am a product of CRWM. Uh, so um, then we got married. I actually resigned from my job. I was teaching economics in a university, and then I became a full-time wife. <laughs> uh, because we have to be stewards of our children. And then uh, when we were, he, I joined him in church planting in Leganes, Iloilo, for, and then the Lord, after that church was planted and organized, the Lord uh, brought us to another island where there was our Christian Reform Bible College. So when the administrator knew that I finished economics, that I was teaching economics, she asked me to teach stewardship. And I said, huh, what's, what's that? What's the relationship? And when I was looking for the references, the books, the reading materials, I found out Economics is actually stewardship. So, um, so uh, I was so happy that the Lord, even if I was not yet a Christian, led me to do economics. You know, I mean, God in His providence, when He calls you, He has pre He will be preparing you, even if you do not know that He is preparing you. So then I found out that it's bi biblical economics. So uh, since then, my heart was taken by the Lord to be um, very much in love with, with promoting stewardship. So in short, <laughs> I have been a student of Laurie Barquette. If you know him, he's a Christian financial uh, uh, stewardship trainer. He has died already. And um, so uh, when we came here for his PhD, uh, we volunteered with Crown Financial Ministries and uh, so I have all those reading materials and then the Dave Ramsey financial stewardship uh, materials and everything and everything. But then uh, uh, we were, after his PhD, we were sent by the mission to Beijing and then, but in his grace, he returned us back to the Philippines where Stan is teaching at the Asian Theological Seminary. And then you know what? I found out that ATS, Asian Theological Seminary, is offering an MBA in Biblical Stewardship in Christian Management. And so I talked to the director and I said, you know my heart is into stewardship, can I also teach? And she said, no. <laughs> <laughs> she said, you have to enroll, you have to finish MBA first, and then after that, you, you may be qualified to teach. So for, uh, while adjusting in the Philippines, 2015, I started my program, and pre 
praise the Lord, by June of last year, 2016, I finished it. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Lord. And, I, and the Lord enabled me to put together everything that, uh, that was in my heart. So, so that MBA is like a, uh, a, a, a venue for me to summarize, to put together what the Lord has been teaching me all along. And he enabled me to write a paper, the title is Using Social Marketing to Grow Stewardship Champions Among Leaders of the Christian Reformed Church of the Philippines. We can tweak it and it can be applicable for church leaders of CRCNA. So I have a PDF copy if you're interested. I can send it to you and you never know, maybe you can use it. <laughs> yeah, so, so pray, <laughs> pray that when we go back, I'm so excited to go back in July because we are piloting it in one of the classes in the CRCP. So I'm, I have started already. But I can't wait for July so that we can have a full-blown training. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Stay here, Bessie. God, God intends for us to be stewards of what he's provided for us. And of course, he always makes provision for us. And um, you could see how God was moving in Bessie's life and in stands to hear the call of God to go where the Lord would use them. And Bessie told you about the, the, the other stuff, but boy, the ministry that she's been doing there, the doors that the Lord has opened have been tremendous. And we're seeing the fruits of that, that work uh, there in the Philippines even now. And the fruit of that work will come here to us as well. So we give God praise and glory for that. We um, want to introduce Stan to you. Um, Stan has been working for the Lord. How long, Stan? Ooh, let's see, <laughs> about uh, 29 years, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. God called him to the work of the ministry, and uh, he has not looked back since. And we partnered with Stan and Bessie uh, several years ago as an outcome from our ministry fair. And as a result of the ministry fair, the missions team was formed, and we needed to make a decision about a ministry. Our, our, um, our missionaries that we previously had had moved on and went to a, uh, another ministry, and so God was speaking to us about continuing the effort to support the missions that is going around the world. Mm -hmm. And so um, we looked hard and sought the Lord and found Stan and Bessie. <laughs> and they've been partners with us ever since. And so Stan, tell us a little bit about what God has been doing with you during this time. Yes, well, uh, it wasn't exactly easy for us to leave uh, Beijing. We were having a great time there, but it seemed uh, to fit better for me to be teaching at the seminary uh, in Manila. So this is an interdenominational seminary, Asian Theological Seminary. I teach in the missions department, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about it later. But what we're seeing is that God is using Filipinos and other Christians in, in Asian countries to go out and reach the people that still have never heard the gospel, places that are, it's hard for, for white-faced uh, uh, Western missionaries to go to, but Asians can be more effective in those places. So I have a role, in, especially in training um, some of those leaders to go out beyond the Philippines to other countries, and that's really exciting. Amen, amen. So once again, I'd like for you to give a warm welcome to Stan and Bessie, and we're going to give the mic to Stan so he can bring us the word of God this morning. Thank you so much, uh, Lee, for introducing us that way. And uh, just before the message, we're going to show a quick video that kind of summarizes our ministry. So we'll, we'll do that now, uh, the video, and uh, then we'll begin go into the message. Thank you. 
In recent decades, we have been seeing a major shift in global missions. Many countries that were receiving missionaries in the past are now sending missionaries outside their borders. During this past term, we've been able to participate in this shift through our ministry with Christian Reformed World Missions in the Philippines. I teach in the Missions Department at the Asian Theological Seminary, or ATS, in Manila. ATS is an interdenominational evangelical seminary with about 220 students, mainly Filipinos. Through my missions courses at ATS, I equip gospel workers and mission leaders with biblical principles and wisdom based on experience so they can serve effectively as cross-cultural representatives of Jesus Christ. We now know Filipinos bringing the gospel to Japan, France, Thailand, Kyrgyzstan, the Middle East, and other countries. Many of them are ATS alumni. Some are members of the Christian Reformed Church in the Philippines, or CRCP. They need to be flexible and develop creative strategies because resistance to the gospel is strong in many of these contexts. One of these strategies is called business as mission. Christians well trained in both entrepreneurship and cross-cultural ministry establish bona fide businesses in other countries. Over time, their business relationship open opportunities to witness for Christ in both words and actions. Business as Mission is a standard course for students majoring in missions at ATS. There are about 25 foreign students at ATS, mainly from other countries in Asia, and Stan serves as their chaplain. My name is Tasha. I'm from Indonesia and then uh, I'm taking Christian education here in ATS and this is my uh, I already been here for two and a half years. The IS group helped me to not only to focus on my papers of course the academic things but how to take care of one another and then it helped me also in how to say that to encourage me to study and then when we had free time, we're gonna gather together just for food or have fun. We also serve alongside leaders of the CRCP through training and consultation. My passion is to raise up stewardship champions among leaders in the CRCP who will be models of generous giving. I train church leaders, especially deacons, in biblical and practical stewardship principles. Through this, the church's tithes and offerings grow, enabling them to expand their ministries. The CRCP currently has about 75 local churches and aims to double to 150 churches by the year 2025. Growth in giving tithes and offerings is needed to help reach the church planting goal. There are still huge barriers to the gospel among unreached people groups. But God is working in amazing ways through His people in Asia to bring the gospel to those who have never heard it. It's a great privilege for us to partner with churches and organizations in the U.S. and the Philippines to equip Filipinos and other Asians for ministry in God's kingdom. Thank you so much for partnering with us in our ministry with Christian Reform World Missions. Let's continue to pray and support each other in proclaiming God's kingdom to the ends of the earth and let us give God all the glory. A joy for us to, to be here. As Lee was uh, mentioning earlier, we've been uh, partners with you together in the cause of the gospel. And uh, that's a great joy for us. We partly were here to say thanks, to celebrate that, you know, this partnership together. You've been praying for us. You know, it's just a, a real joy to hear uh, this morning that there are people praying for us. I believe they said every Monday night. Uh, they're praying for us and and that is so encouraging to know that you've been supporting us with your offerings with your gifts and uh, And that is, is such a blessing So we're here to celebrate that to say thanks and to share with you what God is doing uh, through this partnership So let's turn to the scriptures and we'll be reading from the Old Testament from uh, Isaiah chapter 52 uh, so uh, 
You can find it in your Bible. It's about right in the center of your Bible. And uh, it, I believe it will also appear uh, on the screen here. So let's remember that this passage comes from uh, Isaiah about 600, 600 some years before Jesus was born. And, uh, but Isaiah was especially prophesying about what God would be doing in the future after uh, his people had, been, had gone into captivity to Babylon. Uh, now God is promising that he will bring them back. He will restore them and renew them. <clears throat> and so this is what this passage is about. Uh, let's pause and ask God's blessing upon the word uh, before we read. Thank you, Lord God, so much for speaking us, to us through your word in the scriptures. And as we come to your word, we, we give this time to you. We pray especially for the power of your Holy Spirit uh, working in us <clears throat> that uh, as we hear your word, it will, <clears throat> it will be planted deep within us and, uh, and bear fruit for this life and for eternal life, O oh Lord. So, Lord, work in us mightily by your Spirit uh, as we read and hear your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's look at Isaiah 52, verses 5 to 10. And now what do I have here, declares the Lord? For my people have been taken away for nothing, and those who rule them mock, declares the Lord. And all day long my name is constantly blasphemed. Therefore my people will know my name, Therefore, in that day, they will know that it is I who foretold it. Yes, it is I. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the sight of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. May God add his powerful blessing to his word this morning. Better make sure my throat is in shape here. <clears throat> Suppose that you are a senior in high school and, and you're on the starting five of the girls' basketball team. Now, for most of us, that does take a lot of imagination, but... Um, but suppose that you're on the basketball team and you have a very important game. It's an away game. In fact, it's quite far away. Your parents are not able to go and attend the game, but you've got to win this game. It's, it's so close all through the game, neck and neck. But in the, in the fourth quarter, the opposing team is ahead. But then in the last couple minutes of play, your team catches up and then you score the winning basket. You've won the game. And so what do you do right away? You get on your your cell phone and you call your, your parents and you say, hey, dad and mom, uh, I want to tell you the gospel. We won the game. Is that what you would say? <laughs> well, it might be something like that, but I kind of doubt if you would use that word gospel there. But you know, the word gospel that we read often in the Bible, it, it simply means good news. It means something good has happened. It's a, it's a joyful announcement. In fact, uh, it came earlier in the Old Testament, it came from uh, the, the, the battle situation. You know, the, the king would be in Jerusalem like King David. He would be in his palace in Jerusalem, but he would send his army out to fight the enemies. And they would, they would go through the battle, and, and uh, when they won the battle, then the commanding officer would, uh, would appoint someone to go and run and bring the good news of victory to the king. And so he would go and announce to the king, good news, we won the battle. With God's help, we have victory. In fact, in the, in the Greek version of the Old Testament, you know, the, originally the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, but there was a Greek translation which was especially being used at the time of, Je excuse me, at the time of Jesus. And uh, the word there for the person who would run and bring good news was the term evangelizer. You know, the one bringing the good news was the evangelizer, the one who would run and report 
to the king. So, so you can see where we're going with this. This is good news that, that uh, goes beyond just that situation of battle. It's even more important than that. But, uh, but no, now notice in, in Isaiah, it has a little bit of a different meaning in the passage we, we read. Let's look again at verse 7. It says, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring glad tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, Your God reigns. So yes, it's a joyful announcement, but it's not so much about a, an earthly king winning a battle. It's really about the reign of God. And when God truly reigns, then there is peace, there's salvation, there are good relationships among people. It's, it's, it's true shalom, the, the peace of God, the harmony, the, the, the well-being of people. And this is news, good news that's supposed to go to the ends of the earth, uh, he says. Uh, so that's this meaning, this, this sense of good news has a deeper meaning. Now if we move even forward some more to the time of Jesus, we see as Jesus begins his ministry, he has the same theme that he talks about. Notice the words of Jesus in, in Mark chapter, uh, chapter 1. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into, into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Now, uh, when, when Jesus' listeners heard this, I can just imagine them thinking, well, this sounds like Isaiah. And they would be thinking back to the same passage that we read, uh, good news. Now we might not quite see that because of that word kingdom there. Uh, but actually a better translation of that, that term kingdom is, is reign. It's, it's the reign of God. It's not a territory with borders, but it's, it's the active reign of God. When, when God is truly in charge and when people submit to his rule, then there is that shalom. Then there is peace. There's good relationships with God. There's good relationship among people because they are submitting to the reign of God. And that really was good news for the people at that time uh, when Jesus was beginning his ministry. We see it even more fully a little bit later on in Jesus' ministry, and we see that in, in Matthew chapter 9. Just want to read these, these few verses where we see it not only announced, but we see it happening. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. So we see here uh, even more what happens when the reign of God is announced, this good news. Uh, people's lives are changed. People are healed. Uh, people receive their sight. Demons are cast out. And, and God truly reigns supreme in their lives. People receive forgiveness of their sins and, and, and their lives are really turned around. Uh, so what we see happening here is that, uh, you know, Jesus not only announces good news, he is the good news. He himself is the good news of the reign of God because as we're going to celebrate a little bit later uh, with the Lord's Supper, Jesus went to the cross. He gave his body and his blood uh, for our sins that we could be reconciled to God uh, and have peace with him and enjoy this life that he gives us here and now and for eternity. Jesus truly uh, was and is that good news. And that's something that we have to keep in mind when I train people in evangelism in the Philippines. Uh, one thing I say is that we need to be good news people, not just announcing good news. Uh, you know, if we're, if we're bad news people, if we're critical and cutting people off on the highway, uh, if we're lazy or greedy, uh, people are not going to listen to us when we bring good news. Uh, our lives have to show what, 
what, what, what Jesus is talking about by really living it out, by being truly disciples of Jesus Christ, following him, not just believing in our minds, but, but really living it out. And we need to be good news churches, uh, churches that reach out and, and serve the community, uh, that are willing to sacrifice to help people in their needs and, and truly uh, reach out to them. So, uh, yes, we need to be good news people. But Jesus mentioned a problem here. Did you notice that? He said, yeah, the, the harvest is plentiful, but there's a problem. The workers are few. And we'll come back to that uh, a little bit later uh, because that's still a problem uh, today, uh, here and now. Now, I want to go one step further in, in the New Testament. After Jesus had died and risen from the dead and, and, and uh, went back up to heaven, uh, the Holy Spirit came and sent Jesus' followers out to bring the gospel. And one of them, the Apostle Paul, uh, went far and wide and, and also wrote letters. One of his letters, uh, we'll read a few verses from that, the letter to the Romans. And, and, and notice these words uh, from the Apostle Paul. He says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So does that sound like Isaiah once again? The very passage that we read, that's exactly what, what the Apostle Paul is quoting. And what the point that, that uh, the Apostle Paul is making here is that everyone can be saved, Jew and Gentile. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord can be saved. But there, there's kind of a chain of necessity here. There's some things that have to, to fall into place, and, and I won't go through all those, but I want to go to the last one that we may tend to miss, is that someone has to be sent. <laughs> so uh, there has to be the sending of a messenger, otherwise how are people going to uh, hear the gospel? And that, you know, even back in the Old Testament, you know, when they won a battle, uh, a, a particular person could not just decide, I'm going to go run and bring the news to the king. No, he had to be commissioned by the commanding officer. He had to be sent. And, and you know, I think of the words of Jesus. After he rose from the dead, he, he had his disciples with him. And Jesus said to them, as the Father has sent me, I am now sending you. Uh, and, and that really applies to all of us. We as God's people are sent by Jesus into the world to be his good news people, to tell them this great news that they may believe and, and enjoy this life that, that God is so ready to give us. Uh, we're all sent. Maybe some of us are sent across the ocean uh, to another country, but most of us maybe just be sent across the street or uh, across to the other side of town. Uh, the other side of the railroad tracks or whatever it might be to, to share this great news um, to people right around us. We are all sent. But, you know, the church, God through the church does commission and send particular people as full-time workers of bringing the gospel. And, and that is a great um, privilege for us to be sent by you. Uh, but it's a, it's a very important role to send, to be the senders. Uh, you know, we couldn't go uh, unless we are sent. And sending is not just, you know, sending people out the door. It's really training people. It's, it's mobilizing people for God's mission. It's, it's supporting them in finances and in prayers. And, and we just want to thank you for taking that role that God gives you. Uh, to send and support missionaries to other parts of the world. So we need both. We need goers and we need, uh, we need senders. We need uh, home-based missionaries like yourselves doing God's mission here and uh, field-based missionaries like ourselves going uh, to another country. Both parts are very important. Um, but now coming back to that problem that Jesus mentioned the, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And you know, look at this chart a minute, and especially that, that red part there. This is really, uh, 
this is really scary in a way. 29% of the world's population still have virtually no exposure to the good news. Uh, they've not heard. Now that may sound strange in this, in this age when we have so, so many methods of communication. Uh, how could it be that some have never heard? Well, the barriers are so great. Um, it's not only geographical barriers and language barriers. It's barriers, spiritual barriers. It's political barriers. Um, you know, we cannot easily go to some of these countries uh, of unreached peoples and share the gospel. But now God is raising up uh, new missionaries from other countries. You've, I'm sure you've heard about the missionary movement from Korea. And that's just amazing. God is using thousands of missionaries uh, from Korea going all over the world. And, and they are amazing workers for God's kingdom. And now missionaries are coming out from China. I just want to tell you a quick story. Um, I, I actually, um, I spent about a month in China, uh, almost two years ago now, and I arrived in a, in a large major city and took a taxi to the home where I would spend a few days with a couple uh, who were hosting me, and when I came into their apartment, there a missionary trainer was training a young lady to go out from China as a missionary to Kyrgyzstan. And I was just amazed. Actually, they were a part of a, a group of churches that were coming together to, to train and mobilize and send missionaries to other parts of China and even outside China to other countries. God is starting to work in amazing ways through his people in China uh, as missionaries. And as you probably have guessed, it's also happening in the Philippines. And actually it's been going on for, for quite a while that, that God is raising up missionaries from the Philippines going to other countries. And I just want to tell you about a few of them. One is, is a dear friend of ours, uh, Chi Chi, and uh, we've known her for many years. She's, she was part of a congregation that we were also a part of in Bacolod City in the Philippines. And uh, she eventually went to Cambodia with Translators Association of the Philippines to work in translating uh, scripture into uh, a language for a tribal group that still did not have the Bible in their, their own language. Now she has returned to the Philippines and continues in translation work in the southern Philippines in a predominantly Muslim area. And uh, she continues serving the Lord, a faithful worker, uh, translation work, which is so crucial for the work of the gospel. And then I think of um, another couple that we got to know uh, a few months ago, and uh, Justin and Carol. And... Uh, you know, we just met them a few months ago and, and found out that they are living and working in a country in the Middle East, a Muslim, a predominantly Muslim country, and, and uh, they are being used of God to train Filipino workers there and Christians from other countries to, to bring the gospel to people right around them, mainly to Muslim people. There are many Filipinos uh, working uh, laboring in the Middle Eastern countries. And, and this couple, they are training these people to bring the gospel. So through this kind of a way, God is using Filipinos to reach the Muslim world with the gospel. And then one, one more couple, Roger and Michelle, and uh, they are students at Asian Theological Seminary where I teach. And in fact, they actually met in my class. Uh, the first year I was teaching the, the basic missions class, they, they were both in the class and met there and got to know each other and eventually they were married last June and uh, God has put Thailand on their hearts. They've been to Thailand already on short-term exposures and, and their goal is really to uh, establish a business in, in Thailand and be, through that to be able to develop relationships with people, share the gospel and plant churches in Thailand. This is a method that God is, is working through many people, especially Filipinos in other parts of the world, through entrepreneurial development. They have access, they have ways to bring the gospel to people that otherwise uh, would not be able to hear. And so we just, we praise God. It's a great privilege uh, for me as a teacher in the seminary to be training Filipinos and uh, students from other countries who are going out as workers in God's kingdom, especially to reach 
uh, the unreached. So, as we, we come toward the end, maybe I've kind of raced through this, but I, I want to just mention a few more things in, in terms of stewardship um, because it's very difficult for Filipino churches to send out missionaries, especially to support them financially. Some of these churches ha are struggling just to support their local pastor. Uh, some of our Christian Reformed pastors in the Philippines only receive about $100 a month uh, of support from their congregations. So, so to think about uh, supporting missionaries it almost sounds like a burden. But God is, is working through them and, uh, and it is happening. And that's one reason why Bessie is especially focusing on stewardship training. With that goal of uh, developing givers' hearts and raising up stewardship champions, especially among the leaders of the churches, uh, who will in turn become models of giving. Uh, through that, the church's giving can grow to support their own ministries locally and also to be sending out missionaries to other countries. So that is happening and, uh, and God is blessing that work. I uh, just want to share this verse that uh, is kind of a theme verse that encourages us and inspires us from the words of Paul again but since you excel in everything in faith in speech and knowledge and in complete earnestness and in the love that we have kindled among you see that you also excel in this grace of giving uh, that inspires us in uh, this whole area of stewardship so how about if we check our feet how how beautiful are our feet uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a great privilege for us to be beautiful feet people, not because our feet are really so good looking, but uh, they're beautiful because we're being used of God. We're, we're, we're bringing the gospel. We're, we're running to share the gospel with others. And uh, all of us need to be beautiful feet people, whether we're going far away or staying close to home, sharing and, and bringing the gospel to others. And so uh, let's rejoice in this uh, honor that God gives us to be his agents in this world and in our partnership together in this work, whether it's in the Philippines, whether it's here, wherever it might be, we are partners together in God's mission and God is using it, using us in that process. So as we will be going into the communion service and we are kind of reflecting, we, we think about how Jesus gave his life for us uh, the Father sent Jesus, and then Jesus says, so now I send you. And yes, that, that sending does, uh, it's not always easy. There, is, there are struggles, there is suffering, uh, there are many difficulties to face, but however we are called by God, God will work through us, His Spirit will always be with us. Jesus promised, I will be with you to the end of the age. And so whatever God is calling us to do, Let's take it up. Let's, let's surrender to him and be used of him. Uh, and so later on as we have a time of prayer, uh, think about what, what is God calling you to do? What, what is God calling you to be and, and respond to the call of God in your life? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord God, so much that uh, you work through us. We're amazed to think that in spite of our sinfulness in spite, in spite of our weakness and failings you you still work through us uh, that's your way of getting the gospel to the world is through your people and so pray that we'll be faithful we thank you for amazing things that you are doing uh, around the world and lord we want to offer ourselves once again to be used of you take us and use us as you please for your service O lord in jesus name amen <laughs>